And greetings. Happy Friday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show, live and on demand here on Blaze TV radio and podcast. Steve Dace here alongside Todd Erzin, Aaron McIntyre, and our old friend, the op ed page editor at uh, Newsweek, Josh Hammer, will be joining us here momentarily for the Dace Group. But first, let us know what you think about what we think. You can email the program, steve at stevedace.com. That's D-E-A-C-E. Like us on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter, uh, at Steve Dace Show. And then there are always the pro-free speech, anti-Civil War alternatives. Uh, look for my name, Steve Dace, on Parler. That's the one guaranteed spot you'll be able to get all of our updated COVID stuff, uh, as well as MeWe and Gab. And if you're looking for clips of the show that you can watch for free and then hopefully share and and sample with others go to youtube.com slash steve dace again that's youtube.com slash steve dace or rumble.com slash steve dace show we're winding down the study of my most recent book a nefarious carol we talked about it yesterday on theology thursday still time for you to get your copy you and get the audible version as well performed by my oldest daughter and i if you've had a chance to read or listen to the book and you enjoyed it please leave us a five-star review on amazon but if you don't have your copy yet you may go to amazon and get yours today you can also just bypass big tech altogether at amazon and get autograph copies directly through Premier Collectibles. Uh, the link to that is posted at the top of both my Facebook and Twitter feeds. Of course, it's a Friday, so you know what that means. Uh, Feedback Friday is coming your way a little bit later on in the program. We'll respond to some of your responses to us. But before we get to all of that, we begin with the day script. Brought to you by ScoreMaster. You know, it is National Credit Awareness Month. What's your credit score? A lot of Americans think anything above 700 is good. Anything below that is bad. But it's not quite that simple. Uh, And that's where ScoreMaster comes in. It's the new science in credit score. Uh, Regardless of your score, it helps you to experience quickly and easily how you can add plus points that you need to your score. Well, how many? Well, the average ScoreMaster user can get about 60 points to their score added in about three weeks or less. Sometimes, if you make the right move here or there, in just a few days. That makes a huge difference, not just in whether you get that home, auto, or business loan approved, but even if you can get an approval, what kind of terms? are available to you as well. And a lot of employers are looking at credit scores uh, when screening and vetting candidates these days as well. So sign up in just about one minute. See how many plus points that you can add to your score. With ScoreMaster, they put you in control of your credit score. Visit scoremaster.com slash Steve. Again, that's scoremaster.com slash Steve. Let us begin our weekly look at the week that was with issue one, Bleep, Lord Nefarious says. B is for buy. C is for coming out. I am a white, transmasculine, femme, non-binary, temporarily, mostly able-bodied, neurodivergent, obsessive, compulsive, chronically ill, culturally Jewish, unitarian, universalist, non-monogamous, demi-low romantic, gray demi-bisexual, survivor of acute and complex trauma, millennial, and cat parent in mental health recovery. Q is for gay. H is for hope. Some have questioned the maturity of our youth. I don't. 16 and 17 year olds today possess wisdom and maturity defined by today's challenges, hardships, and opportunities. I is for intersex. J is for joy. Do you feel or how do you feel about the decision to extend the security perimeter uh, and the presence of the National Guard at the Capitol? It's something we have to do, unfortunately, because the threat of white nationalists and and, and white supremacists is real. Since the investigation is going on, you have not determined the exact cause of the death? Uh, that means we can't yet uh, d- disclose a, a cause of death at this stage. But you have determined the cause of death. I, I didn't say that. We're not at a point where we can disclose uh, or confirm okay. a cause of death. M is for non-binary. You guys see any of those QAnon folks around here today? It's been super quiet. 
It's more media than anybody else, huh? David, we're sitting by for Governor Cuomo's press conference, his daily briefing. How would you contrast Cuomo and President Trump's handling of the crisis? Truth versus mendacity. Governor Cuomo um, out there day after day after day, everything Trump isn't. Honest, direct, brave. Real leadership of the kind the president of the United States should have provided. Governor Cuomo is clearly living in a totally different reality, the actual one, than the president of the United States. Governor Cuomo has become a national leader. For a lot of people, Andrew Cuomo has become the leader of the Democratic Party. He is conveying incredible strength. In order to open these doors, we do not say open sesame, we say open Biden. That's our magic word. Open Biden. I love it. Lizzie Pinelli, uh, uh, excuse me, Pinnell, and uh, what am I doing here? I'm going to lose track here. And the last thing, the last thing we need is the Neanderthal thinking that in the meantime, everything's fine, take off your mask. They literally want to sacrifice the lives of our fellow Texans for, I don't know, for, for political gain, to satisfy certain powerful interests within the state. And, and this isn't hyperbole. But my hope is by this time next year, we're going to be back to normal. And before that, my hope. T is for Clowns. Ron DeSantis, which uh, he's used his stupidity uh, on addressing COVID as actually his calling card for running for president in 2024. Christy Nome, who uh, was stupid enough, uh, thought she was being cool on 4th of July uh, to say, we're having this big event and no, you don't have to wear masks. Q is for... I don't know what Q... That's okay. Q is for queer. Queer. Let's get to it. Josh, as the guest this week, you get to go first. What was the best of the worst of this week? Steve, uh, as usual, I don't really know where to start here. Um, you know, I this is not my answer, but just a quick note on what we saw with the children's book there. You know, if we go back to kind of uh, something that, that we've discussed on the show many times, which is the kind of whole French Amari debate and the future of conservatism. This is kind of exactly where it all started, right? Was kind of the drag queen story hour. Mm-hmm. That, that, that was that was literally how this whole conversation got started. And like whether the blessings of liberty actually means the blessings of hedonism or just the blessings of actual liberty. So that was just a very kind of visceral, like, let's take it in. Let's look at what's happening to America's youth today. Really just harrowing, truly just awful, just a truly abysmal stuff right there. But my actual answer to the question is a little different because I actually wrote a column on this today, which is this Neanderthal logic nonsense. And I know that I'm preaching to the choir of all choirs here, right? When it comes That's to okay. Dr. Fauci. That's when okay. it comes rub, to Dr. Rub, Fauci rub our tummies. That. Go ahead, Josh. You may rub <laughs> our tummies. Go ahead. Yes. Um, look, the reality, Steve, is, you know, I, 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 w- I was actually texting just this morning, um, you know, with a fellow Blaze TV host, my friend Sarah Gonzalez, because I, I, I used to live in Dallas. When I went on Sarah's show a lot, towards the very, very, very beginning of all this, kind of like mid to late last March, maybe maybe even early April, I was slightly more on board with kind of the whole 15 days to, sl- to slow the spread thing than some of my fellow conservatives were. It seemed to me like at that time when we truly didn't know anything at all that it might be worth just being cautious and kind of, uh, you know, restricting our movement for the common good, for the elderly, whatever. But it just very quickly became apparent that politicians were not doing this, right? The politicians of both parties were trying to take a once a lifetime, once a generation power grab and try to take away liberties that we the people have fought for for centuries to try and uphold and, and, and maintain forever. So when you take that, And when you look at the fact that Joe Biden is calling literally a year now, we are 350 plus days into 15 days to slow the spread. And now Greg Abbott and and Governor Reeves, Mississippi, have the temerity. They have the chutzpah of calling off statewide mask mandates. By the way, local local jurisdictions probably can still do that if they want to. This is all we're just talking about statewide stuff right now. And private businesses, of course, do that if they want to. But for having the temerity to say that you don't have to by, by dint of state law to wear a face diaper over your face when you're walking down the street or wanting to go into a subway to grab a sandwich. This is Neanderthal logic. No, the Neanderthal logic is taking away for a year now the most vital and precious and rudimentary and fundamental liberties that our forefathers literally fought a revolution for. That is the Neanderthal logic. So this is totally inverted. I know I'm preaching to the choir of all choirs here, but I kind of had to got to get off my chest. Hey, even Neanderthals knew that you you couldn't change your gender. 
even knew Neanderthals knew what male and female meant. So, uh, Todd, what do you think? What was the best of the worst? And thank you. Thank you for affirming us. We appreciate that, Josh. Thank you. It's a cornucopia of best worst. Aaron, you are so good at this. The way you're not just throwing stuff in there. It's not a catch all You're telling a story. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, phenomenal. Um, th- there's what I don't want this to get lost in there, but the bit of dinner theater that is the perpetual uh, fencing off of downtown DC and yes. the Capitol while the border debate is going on. In the story, they're trying to tell a guy just with a camera rolling tape. Hey, dudes. You see anybody down? You see any QAnon? I mean, and then we what? Al Al Green on the steps where nobody can see him, but stories are being told by the press about how he's going out there to make it. I mean, it is it is remar- Speaking of storytelling, that's all. The, that's all they're doing. It's the propaganda mm-hmm. of what that fence is. Fences that don't work, man. Remember, fences don't work. But these phantom white nationalists are out there coming to get you. They're bad. They're bad. Uh, honestly, again, you need to hear this. We've lived it. History is rife with rotten times, cruel times, dumb times. They've never been crazier. Never. Aaron. Boy, it's it's tough. It's tough to, ch- to, to choose there. Um. Let's go. Let's go with this. Let's go with this direction. Ayanna Presley, I believe that's her name, saying the maturity of sixteen-year-olds. Nope, I'm going to stop you right there. I'm going to stop you <laughs> right there. One time, one time when I was sixteen, my parents don't know this, and they're probably going to be watching this later this evening. You're married and one, giving her grandkid now, so you, you're pretty much forgiven of everything. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, one time when I was 16, my buddies and I were having a difficult time starting a fire uh, out in the windbreak, uh, out in the wooded area, uh, for a little campout thing that we were doing. And so I thought it was a good idea to stand over the measly flame that we had managed to concoct with a, uh, a, a tank full of gasoline and pour it on the gasoline. When it inevitably did the whole whoosh thing about 10, 15 feet in the air, I decided to swing in, you know, in re- re- reacting, I decided to swing that gas can oh, no. and I just like poured fire basically all over the windbreak. That's what I did when I was 16. So, um, that is emblematic though. I, n- not to be, not, not to be, um, BLM writer writers are doing that at 26 and 36. Yeah, exactly. It's a totally different context. Not to be That's- trite with this though. That is emblematic of the way progressivism, uh, works. And manages it's it's not about enfranchising sixteen and seventeen years year olds. This was attached to HR one. This this res- or this uh, amendment was going to be attached to HR one. This is about power, raw power and control. If it means giving it to uh, you know sixteen uh, year olds who are still trying to uh, unstuck the uh, unstick the uh, crayons they've shoved up their nose, um, if that means getting more power and staying in power, they're all for it. Whatever it takes power and the will to it. What is it about the spirit of the age that it wants to kill the, as many of the children as it can before they are born? And then afterwards, just wants to hand the kids a whole bunch of decisions that will then kill themselves or the rest of us. I mean, it's, it's, it is fascinating. It's a fascinating dichotomy. Even hell has its paradoxes, Steve. In, indeed. Um, the tension, the, indeed, the heterodoxical tension of the hellish spirit of the age uh, theology. Let's get to the exit question. On a scale of 1 to 10, with 1 being Joe Biden's current cognitive activity, and 10 being Lindsey Graham's desire to test China's new entry policy. (laughs) Rank this week's level of total depravity, Todd. 10. Josh. Uh, I'll go with a nine. Okay. My mom just texted me, so I'm I'm a little bit bit, uh, uh, scatterbrained now. But it's a 10. (laughs) It's a 10. All right, issue two. Worst. You all right there, Josh? Uh, I I just love the Lindsey Graham joke so much. (laughs) Because you got to look on your face like, you know, I once clerked for the U.S. Circuit yeah. Court of Appeals. <laughs> what what the hell? A guy that this might be on the Supreme Court one day. What the hell am I doing here? He's got that look on his face, right? Okay. Uh, issue two, worst insurrection ever. 
More and more details are trickling out about what really happened at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. One thing we do not know, though, is the cause of death of Capitol Police Officer Brian Sicknick, as FBI Chief Chris Wray informed the Senate this week. So does that mean since the investigation is going on, you have not determined the exact cause of the death? Uh, that means we can't yet uh, disclose a cause of death at this stage. But you have determined the cause of death. I, I didn't say that. We're not at a point where we can disclose uh, or confirm okay. a cause of death. Top FBI official Jill Sanborn was asked how many weapons were recovered amid the supposed armed insurrection. To my knowledge, we have not recovered any on that day from any other arrests at the scene at this point. But I don't want to speak on behalf of Metro and Capitol Police, okay. but to my knowledge, none. So no, nobody's been charged with an actual firearm weapon in the Capitol or on Capitol grounds? Correct. The closest we came was the vehicle that uh, had the Molotov cocktails in it. And when we did a search of that vehicle later on, there was a weapon. But How, how many shots were fired that we know of? I believe the only shots that were fired were the ones that resulted in the death of the um, one lady. Okay. Nevertheless, the National Guard has been occupying D.C. for the better part of the last couple of months with no additional insurrections to show for it. This past week, a conspiracy theory was floated by the government and the media that QAnon supporters were going to show up on March 4th for the original inauguration day and cause a ruckus. As the Daily Caller found out, of course, there were more media than Q supporters in attendance. You guys see any of those QAnon folks around here today? It's been super quiet. It's more media than anybody else, huh? At least it's a pretty beautiful day, right? A recent YouGov survey found 44% of Donald Trump supporters have never heard of QAnon. In the aftermath of a devastating two months of zero violence and zero threats capped off by a couple of randos who probably showed up at the Capitol yesterday, Capitol Police have requested the National Guard continue to provide security for the area for another two months. So let's recap. By the way, you can say her name. Ashley Babbitt was her name, and um, she served the country, uh, actually. So at the very least, I think she deserves to have her name recognized. But um, no weapons, no gunshots, and either they don't know yet what happened to Officer Signick, or they won't tell us. And the family, going on two months now since he died, Hasn't been told either. And yet his death is really what has triggered everything that has gone on in the country since, essentially. Um, what, what is this? Todd, I'll start with you. What, what, what actually happened that day? What do you think happened based on the information that we have? I, I really don't think it's complicated. You had how many people there? Total, what's the estimate of the... It's the, in the tens of thousands. Okay, yeah. a, a lot of people. The, y you pushed a segment of America to the brink. And that, that number simply ultimately can't be controlled. Every single movement with that level of energy involved has those within it who simply are not ultimately disciplined enough to handle the emotional energy uh, of the moment or are honestly have decided to take things way to uh, uh, another level. And it got out of control. That does not speak to the overall health of the reason why almost all of the people, and I say that with confidence, why almost all of the people were at the mall that day. And it is, this isn't it, pushing past the gates Taking people's house back. Listen, I, with no weapons, again, no weapons. This is the come and take it crowd yes. now, right? Yes. I mean, how many concealed carry licenses do you think were in that crowd that day? And none of them showed up. to when to they, How were they planning on assassinating Mike Pence without any weapons? So the come and take it crowd, the, how many lifetime NRA memberships are in that crowd of tens of thousands? Right. None of them had any weapons. Right. Now, listen, these doesn't are, sound like much of a plan. That's that's the worst planned insurrection of all time. Yes. Agreed. Th these are post 9-11 days. But if memory serves correctly, after Andrew, uh, the po a populist wave swept Andrew Jackson into 
uh, the White House and beat uh, John Quincy Adams. The, it was basically a free for all in the White House. The doors were just open and people now again, different times. But that is the level of energy was at the mall that day and also by the way i don't the evidence that there were very much uh warnings given uh to nancy pelosi that maybe you want to beef up security that were ignored i haven't seen those totally uh put out so there's there's bigger questions than what level of guilt the crowd is guilty of how about the bureaucrats that we know are the one the, the presleys of the world who thinks the 16 year olds should be voting Maybe we need to ask them some uh, deeper questions about their level of complicity and what they wanted to happen. Do you really think people like that didn't want this to happen? I'm not saying they caused it to happen, but did they want it to happen? I think we all know the answer to that. Josh, what happened that day? To the best of your knowledge, with the information we have, what happened? So I actually don't have a whole lot to add to Todd's answer. I think Todd basically nailed this. Um, you know, if you look at the actual footage from January 6th, and none of us should try to belittle what happened, it obviously was a very terrible day for the country. Um, and frankly, I actually don't even oppose as a matter of principle the idea of a commission. Um, I, I'm very skeptical as to how that would be carried out, but I think in principle it's not the, necessarily the worst idea in the world. But what happened was, if you look at like what actually happened here, Steve, you're totally right, tens of thousands of people like hundreds, thousands of concealed carriers. And then, you know, a few people get carried away. They get inside and like you look at the photos, they're like taking selfies with selfie sticks in there. This mm -hmm. is like this is like this is basically like a like a football tailgate that just got like a little exactly. too rowdy. Um, you know, I mean, like I, I was on the phone with a high school buddy of mine um, who's uh, who he, both he and his parents live in kind of suburban D.C. in Virginia. His dad was um, was an executive at, at a very reputable hotel company for decades. He was actually one of one of those tens of thousands of people. There were some like very like well informed patriotic. Josh, I've got numerous emails in this audience from people who were there who had no idea this even went on until they got back to the buses, grabbed their phones to get on, you know, social media to get caught up and see what the reaction was. They had no idea this was this had even occurred until they got back from the event itself. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I actually have heard that as well from some people who are there. So, look, um, I, I think Todd is totally right that there are a lot of questions on the bureaucratic side, okay? There are a lot of questions surrounding Capitol Hill police. We absolutely should try to get to the bottom of that, whether it's a commission, whether it's some sort of other means to do so. Um, the National Guard took for, took hours and hours to respond. It's not entirely obvious to me what was going on there as far as the chain of command, who was making what orders, who was calling what shots. That sort of stuff really needs to be kind of figured out here. But if I can just kind of um, make a slightly lawyerly point as a token lawyer in the program, the word insurrection here, that has a very precise meaning, actually. The word insurrection goes back hundreds of years. This is a this is a term that was well understood, you know, at English common law. If this was an actual insurrection. If this was anywhere close to an insurrection, there would have been U.S. Marines. There would have been Humvees. There would have been choppers. That was not an insurrection, Steve. And the fact that the left can get away with just using the word, similar, by the way, to the fact that Joe Biden used, uh, you know, as a Jew, this is like particularly horrific. He used the phrase, the big lie, you know, a, a, a Nazi Goebbels reference to mm -hmm. refer to Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley. The, the left just, they love taking these words and stretching them to to places where they simply do not belong and they never should go. And it is incumbent on us to speak up and not let them do it, because this was simply not anywhere remotely resembling a quote-unquote insurrection. The, what you just said to me brings uh, to mind a conversation I had with our audience a couple days ago. And, you know, uh, um, you're far more educated than I am, obviously, and I have a great respect for your intellect, but we're both fairly intellectually driven. And I think when you are such a person, you have a temptation to immediately repel those who you think are being overcome by their passions in a moment and to think, OK, cooler heads prevail. Let's think this through. There must be some reasonable process or solution that's attainable here before we're all overcome with our emotions. Is that is that fair? Is that is that a fair description? OK, totally. OK, totally. And I think this probably led to some of your initial um, willingness on to co on COVID to listen, or even just a moment ago when you said, hey, I'm fine with a committee. I, I think what I had to learn in the last couple of years, Josh, I mean, if you'd have told me three, four years ago that the whole Mueller probe would end up being a sham, I'd have said, no way. 
I, I just looked at Robert Mueller's record of serving to the country, serving the country, and frankly, it's a hell of a lot more of a service record than Donald Trump ever had. And I would have said, no way, no how. It, there's got to be something there. Now, a man of that magnitude does not put his name on a complete sham. It ended up being a complete sham. Uh, the Kavanaugh thing, complete sham. Should we go on? Okay. I mean, the, the, the Democrats literally put forth a bill in the House and passed it that might as well have been titled OJ's if we did it. I mean, here's how we stole the election uh, in 2020. We're just going to codify the entire process into law now. I think a challenge that, that, that guys like you and I are going to have, and we have others in our industry and movement who are similarly bent, you can't hold on to, you can't be reasonable in an age that lacks all reason. We are up against a, I'm using the term spirit of the age very, very specifically. That's biblical imagery. You're up against uh, a, a force of nature. This isn't a negotiation. This isn't we're different degrees right to left of center. This is a, this is a game of, of, of risk. And one side's going to win this and one side's going to lose it. And it should be totally fine to, to propose a commission to find out what really happened that day. Tell me, tell me one person in, in the entire 535 member U.S. Congress, Josh, that the Democrats could appoint to that event that you would trust. One. Yes. So in practice, I totally agree with you. I, I, my point was actually a very minor one, which is in principle, I could actually, if in theory there were good people there, mm -hmm. it could possibly actually, it, it could vindicate most of the, of the tens of thousands. Hell, I don't even people, trust but, half the Republicans to get appointed, frankly. Okay. I mean, the, the list of people that I would trust is probably 20, 30 on either side, frankly. All right, Aaron, really quick. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I think um, to to quote myself, and I've quoted this multiple times, this is in regards to coronavirus. When coronavirus blows over, which it will, every leftist and their mother's dog is going to point to the suiciding of our economy and way, and way of life as a means to say, look, statist control over your life works. So I think Todd provided the right answer as to what happened on January 6th. Mm -hmm. The real answer is the spirit of what I just what I ju what I just read. The spirit of the age is not content in just winning. They have to win the way they yes. want to win. Yes. The one dangling participle of last year were the BLM riots. Yep. Do you think those were popular? No. What's the most recent thing we're talking about now? The right-wing terrorists. Yep. That's, White nationalist that, riots to that replace is, that narrative. I yep. really believe that as far as that narrative goes, that was the dangling participle, and this is the one that they're using to wrap it up. That's brilliant analysis. Exit question. If how long Washington, D.C. will continue to look like Tiananmen Square were the lyrics to a Stone Temple Pilot song, which Stone Temple Pilot song lyrics would it be? A, where are you going for tomorrow? Where are you going with the mask I found? Or B, all, all, I, all I got is time, got no meaning, just a rhyme. C, you see the look and you see the lies. You'll eat the lies and you will. Or D, leaving on a southern train only yesterday you lied. Now, if all those options seem like the same, they are. I chose them on purpose because I think they're all the same answer. But which of those do you like better, Doc? I think I'll go with C. What do you think, Josh? Uh, C is my answer as well. All right. Aaron? Uh, it depends on how long they keep serving them undercooked chicken, but it's going to be D, actually. I think it, I think they're going to be out of it fairly soon. Yeah, I, I would probably vote for A just because it throws the mask in there, too. All right. I get a little bit more bang for my buck. But on purpose, I chose song lyrics that all discuss deception and an indeterminate amount of time. Because they're, it's going to look like that for as long as they need it to, uh, and not a moment, a moment less, and, until the narrative doesn't work and plays itself out, and that's it. And it won't be a minute sooner than that, unless your governors, like there should not be a single Republican governor that has a single National Guards person there, for example, unless they call them home. All right, we'll come back. Red versus blue on reopening. We've got some blue state Neanderthals now to talk about. We'll get to that here next. All right, back here on the Steve Day Show, live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio and podcast. You know, you've got millions of reasons to be stressed these days, but stressing out about male pattern baldness and receding hairlines does not have to be one of them because the good news is that Keeps can help. Keeps offers the same doctor-recommended, FDA-approved hair loss treatments, but the generic versions is what they offer. So they're a lot cheaper. You only pay about half the cost and you get a great deal. And the other thing you're going to love about Keeps is the convenience. Everything's done 
online, answer a few easy questions, snap a few pics of your hair, and then a licensed doctor will review your info and recommend the right hair loss treatment for you. So convenience, generic versions for big savings. How about another discount on top of that? Uh, shipped right to your door for half off your first order today. Half off your first order today when you go to keeps.com slash grow. That's K-E-E-P-S for keeps.com slash grow. Again, that's keeps.com slash grow. We welcome back in our good friend of the op-ed page editor at Newsweek, Josh Hammer here with us as we continue on with our weekly look at the week that was. Here's issue three, red versus blue on reopening. Cases and deaths from coronavirus have been falling precipitously for nearly two months in the United States. And as the spring weather moves in, apparently some states are ready to relax. Texas Governor Greg Abbott made his announcement this week. I'm issuing a new executive order that rescinds most of the earlier executive orders. Effective next Wednesday, all businesses of any type are allowed to open 100 percent. That includes any type of entity in Texas. Also, I am ending the statewide mask mandate. That was followed by Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves doing the same. And the governor's office is getting out of the business of telling people what they can and cannot do. This follows news from Pennsylvania that they'll be decreasing some restrictions in that state, including their repressive flight restrictions as well. News broke yesterday that the state of Connecticut is going to be lifting all capacity limitations on restaurants, retailers, libraries, personal services, gyms and churches. Dr. Anthony Fauci in one of his few media appearances this week said it just is inexplicable why you would want to pull back now. I understand the need to want to get back to normality, but you're only going to set yourself back. Meanwhile, in blue states, Ohio Governor Mike DeWine, yes, I did that on purpose, announced this week he'll consider lifting restrictions in his state once they reached 50 COVID cases per 100,000 residents. In California, Governor Gavin Newsom slammed the news out of Texas before encouraging his state to double mask. Joe Biden announced this week he expects the United States to have enough vaccine supply for every adult by the end of May. So I guess now, do we have all these sporting events now in Connecticut, too? All right. All right. Given the advent of vaccines, the plummeting hospitalizations, Biden's promise as a candidate to return us to normal. It's pretty clear much of America's patience with this is wearing out. If you look at a lot of the most recent polling that's out there, how much longer can any governor, red or blue, hold out here? Now, to me, DeWine is a special case. And as someone who has covered this story as extensively as anyone for the last year, I don't know of another governor in America like Mike DeWine. Mike DeWine is hopelessly devoted to coronavirus. Then he saw those coronavirus spikes. Now he's a believer. Dude conducts sonnets to coronavirus. This is not some lefty governor on a power mad trip or some rhino who doesn't want to stand up to the Karens in the uh, Karen suburban voters. Mike DeWine is a disciple. He's all in on this. I mean, Mike DeWine is a human anal swab. Mike DeWine is in. So let's let's set him aside. I mean, you're going to you're going to drag coronavirus away from Mike DeWine from his cold, dead fingers for the other 49 governors out there, red or blue. How much longer can they hold out here? Josh, I'll start with you. So, I mean, the answer is they can, in theory, hold out for as long as they want to like, technically answer the question. But the, but the problem is that people are going to start leaving. I mean, they, we got to remember, as far as demographics in the United States are concerned, Steve, a lot of these trends that we're seeing, people f- fleeing the Northeast, fleeing New York, fleeing Illinois, fleeing California, for that matter, and moving down to kind of warmer, sunnier, less heavily taxed red states, Texas and Florida, maybe in particular, those trends long predate the coronavirus. In many ways, kind of COVID, I think, has only kind of um, mm-hmm. accentuated it and, and actually just uh, augmented these pre-existing trends. So, look, I, I don't think Gavin Newsom is going to change his mind, for example, anytime soon. Um, I, I frankly, I can't believe really did not realize just how terrible Governor DeWine was on. on a, I, I've seen I've seen her by Daniel Horowitz write about him a little bit, but I guess I didn't realize the extent to which he was a true disciple. I'm talking literal sonnets. He composes sonnets to COVID. Am I, am I making this up? 
This is not some. This is not a Steve Dace um, um, exaggeration for effect. He has literally, literally composed Twitter sonnets to COVID. Literally. Okay, I, I will. After the show is over, that's literally the first thing I'm going to do. Is go <laughs> try, 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 try to hunt down. Uh, what I'm sure is Shakespearean prose. Um, but um, look, I, how long can they hold out? Look, it, Greg Abbott. You know, I, I don't need to remind you. I, I used to live in Texas. Okay. Greg Abbott oftentimes talks a big talk, but he doesn't always walk a big walk. He has a lot of skeptics, a lot of critics in kind of the Texas Freedom Caucus circles, a lot of kind of like the grassroots movement. I think relationships between Cruz World and Abbott World are stressed and, 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 Mm -hmm. you know, a little little dicey to say the least. Mm -hmm. So all all that's to say, if, if Greg Abbott is kind of getting out there and trying to join Ron DeSantis as like a big, iconic, red or red leaning state that's trying to open everything up, at a bare minimum, there is just no excuse for any red state governor whatsoever to not be following this by tomorrow, next or like, tomorrow Saturday, but next week at the, at the at the very latest, right? I think that's what Fauci's concerned about: is um, you, you can't memory hole two of your three biggest states. They've tried doing it with Florida. They have they have tried memory holing and gaslighting Florida, who has seen an eighty percent drop in hospitalizations among seniors since January, by the way. Uh they they are trying to do it with Florida, but now that you have two of your three biggest states in the whole union, um, in California and Florida, now both operating as control groups to basically point out what a malevolent BSer Anthony Fauci has really been. I think that's why he's concerned. I mean, these aren't, you know, renegade states, Todd, uh, that are going to act as control groups against this. I mean, they're two of the most populous states we have in America. So how much longer do you think everybody else can hold out? Once once the dominoes start falling, the competition sets in, as Josh was alluding to, what do you think? Well, I think they can last qu- quite a bit longer, but we're, we're about to find out. We are People have an internal clock. And right now the weather's getting masks when you're inside all the time. You just kind of, there was an inertia to that thing through the winter. Mm-hmm. The, we are now we've been in 50s all week long here in Iowa. Next week we're going to be in a bunch of 60s. You have the year it, it was the year anniversary of uh, now the the NCAA tournament. The one that was canceled is now going to be going through. Mm-hmm. You know, there's just an internal. We're going to see fans in the stands at that yes, event. On yeah. a lot of people, just I I have to move forward. Whatever forward You're is. You're showing I, me all these ads for vaccines. Yes. So you can't sell me vaccines and then tell me to yes. keep doing all of this. But here we're, again, we, the the expert class they don't care look at what we just got done talking about with dr seuss this is only going to in many respects that pushback is only going to energize people like gavin news and the true believers even a guy like david french we got talking to him he went full it's the christian thing to do not months ago he did it today yeah i saw it so listen this is religion to them it's faith do not doubt the power of that darkness to persist just because you understand the reason of this doesn't add up. We're going to find out real quick how much they hate you because they're going to keep stepping on the gas. Aaron? Yeah, I, I think we're going to find out. I mean, my wife and I were talking this week. There is a there is a change afoot, a change in the air. I think with the general uh, general sentiment, um, at least that I can see. I mean, it's really hard to f- really hard to continue calling um, uh, Texas and Mississippi Neanderthals when they're essentially doing the same thing that Connecticut is gonna is gonna start doing. So, um, I, I I think the 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 natural reflex though is what we saw from Gavin Newsom. I mean, dude is facing a recall. I don't know how serious that right. threat actually is. Dude is facing a recall. In the face of that, he sees Texas actually opening up. He says, uh, absolutely. He, he just slammed it. I can't remember exactly what he said. He slammed that, and then he tells the state to double mask. That's the reflex. That's the elitist reflex. When they're told, and you see this with Fauci, too, with the slightest amount of pushback, with the slightest amount of... Oh, crap. There is a a scintilla of a chance that I could be embarrassed. Elitists don't like to be embarrassed. That's the main lesson. They do go into Glenn Close. They will go double and triple and quadruple down until they can declare victory somehow. They do go into Glenn Close mode. I will not be ignored. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Yes. Okay, if you remember Fatal Attraction. Exit question. True or false, given the vaccine timeline laid out by the president, all the trend lines we just talked about? True or false? By June 1st, because I think Connecticut broke the dam. I think it's Connecticut that actually broke the dam yesterday. 
By June 1st, you'll be pretty much back to normal everywhere in America. But the debate will really just be about masks or proof of vaccine to access that normal. True or false? Aaron. True. Todd. False. Josh. Yeah, too soon. I say false. Okay. Uh, issue four goes along with this. So China announced this week that you got to take an anal swab to enter the country now. All right. Putting a whole new spin on the term rear entry. So um, what I want to know, I mean, I, I you got to have to go to China, want to go to China really, really bad, like Hunter Biden bad, you know, uh, to take an anal swab uh, to get in. But what would you take an anal swab to access? What is What if that's what it took? That's what it took for you to access this event or or location. What would you take the anal swab for? Todd, go. Oh, my goodness. You know how when people apply for a new job, like they like delete the Twitter account? When Josh is up for like some huge judgeship or something, <laughs> did, did you cancel all the day's appearances? Are they gone from the interwebs? Because this is happening. <laughs> Oh, um, how about, I think the epitome of sports would be to be able to stand on the gold medal platform as your anthem is playing. So if the Olympics were held in China, you know, maybe I'd have to, in order to have that opportunity, I might have to suffer through that. That's not a bad one. Uh, Aaron, what's your price for... Uh, unlawful carnal knowledge, Aaron. I was going to say something about like um, any any classified files regarding UFOs, but I think those are going to come out anyway. So I'm saying the Vatican archives. Uh, you know what? I would take the anal swab. You, you, that's a good one. I would take the anal swab. This Protestant would for the Vatican archives. I want to know what's in there. All right. So Josh, uh, we are now offering you the same indecent proposal. What is your price? <laughs> So, Steve, my, my mind actually went to a very similar place as Todd's, to be honest with you. Um, I, I, too, like all three of y'all, I'm a huge sports fan. I, I've, I've been very blessed. I, I'm a lifelong Duke basketball fan. I saw Duke win two national titles in person. One of one of them, I was standing the whole game in the student section. The other, I was on the upper levels sit, uh, seated. If I could sit courtside all game to watch Duke play for the national championship in basketball, mm. say against our arch rival in North Carolina, sign me up. I'm in. That's a pretty good one, too. It yeah. is. I would have picked seeing uh, Michigan win the Rose Bowl, but I actually have been given an offer already to do that that doesn't require an anal swab if that should ever occur again. But I like Aaron's suggestion quite a bit. The Vatican archives. I think I think there could be some uh, tasty morsels located hmm. in there. Some juicy nuggets one way or the other. All right, let's get to predictions. Todd, go. Oh, predictions. Uh I think the reason we can't return back to normal is because of the vaccine debate that's uh, coming ahead, and it, it'll just grind the gears well into the summer. Aaron, so there have uh, there have only been there's only been one team since 2002, correct? Yes, uh, to win the national championship. Yes, uh, without being in the top 25 of both defensive and offensive efficiency rankings at Ken Palm. Yep, only one team. In college that, basketball. In college basketball. Yeah. Uh, over the past month, though, since February 5th, there's only one team in all of college basketball that's been in the top 10 of both offensive and defensive efficiency in the entire country, and that would be my Iowa Hawkeyes. I think they are actually going to go to the Final Four. I think what we saw against Michigan, I mean, Michigan's really, really good. They're the best team in the country. Um, but I, I think that was more, at least offensively, that was more of just an aberration. I think Iowa really does have a good chance to go to the Final Four. I could see only well, number five in the country. I absolutely could see him making the Final Four. Josh, go ahead quickly. So, you know, the, the Gavin Newsom's getting all the attention for the recall effort, but there's actually another much lower scale recall effort in California. It involves the district attorney, George Gascon, in Los Angeles. Um, this, he's part of this whole kind of uh, Soros funded progressive prosecutor movement that we've seen kind of lax on crime, uh, you know, bail reform, all that stuff. This is starting to pick up. They're starting to pick up steam there. And I could actually see this being a huge, huge turning point in kind of the anti law enforcement defund the police crowd if George Gascon is actually recalled. I've started to follow the polling a little bit. It's very close, but I will go out on a limb and say that I actually think that he will be recalled. Hmm. Wow. Two recalls in California. That would be something. Uh, my prediction, Mitch McConnell will never be Senate Majority Leader again. And all the people said? Uh, amen. Amen, yes. Thank you. Yes, but I think he's, 
I think he's the 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 likelihood of Trump reemerging. I think he's just about had it, and uh, it's no guarantee they'll take back the Senate next year mm. anyway. So I don't believe he'll ever serve between Trump's refusal to go away uh, and uh, and and the fact that there's no guarantee they win the Senate next year anyway, and his age. I think Mitch McConnell is never Senate Majority Leader ever again. Josh, good to see you as always, brother. Thank you for joining us. You got it. All right. Hope you enjoyed uh, what we just talked about here on the Dace Group. Don't forget, um, if you uh, want to try Rough Greens for the first time, you've never, ever tried it before, and we get it, you know. Um, sometimes you're not sure. Is this something my pet's going to take to or not? Uh, and, it, you know, money can be tight in a lockdown, shutdown economy. That's why right now our friends over at Rough Greens, they're offering you a free bag of this excellent supplement to put the nutrition back in your dog's diet that's likely missing from that store-bought food that's been stripped of all the vitamins, minerals, and nutrients it needs uh, for long shelf life, mass distribution. Same reason we take supplements as humans these days. Same reason your pet needs one, to be healthier and happier. And that's where Rough Greens comes in. Get a free bag of Rough Greens. Try it for free for your pet. Nothing to lose. You just pay for the shipping. All you pay is the shipping when you go to roughgreens.com. R-U-F-F for roughgreens.com. Just pay for the shipping. The bag is free to try it and see if you don't see a difference in your dog in 14 days or less. Roughgreens.com or call 833-ROUGH-DOG. I like that. R-U-F-F-D-O-G. 833-ROUGH-DOG. Feedback Friday coming your way next. And greetings, back with Hour 2, live and on demand here on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. Steve Dace here with Todd Erzin, Aaron McIntyre, and all of you, pardon me, finishing off the last bit of my Built Bar. That's right. The best tasting protein bar you've ever had, or will ever have, uh, and um, the most nutritious candy bar you've ever had. You no longer have to make the choice between eating tastier and healthier with our friends over at Built Bar. They've got a new shipment in of the chocolate chip cookie dough. It is fantastic. That's what I was just eating during the break. Uh, Todd, you've had a chance to sample another new flavor that is outstanding. Uh, the coconut brownie chunk. You're going to think, guys, I could buy this like in the candy aisle at a store. That's how good these are. 150 calories uh, or less often in a lot of these bars. Three to five grams of carbs, sugar in every bar. That's it. Up to 20 grams of protein in every bar as well. Use my last name, Dace, as the promo code to get 20% off, whether it's your first or next order. If you want to go back again for seconds, when you go to builtbar.com, B U I L T. Over 20 flavors, all covered in real chocolate at BuiltBar.com slash Dace. Again, BuiltBar.com slash Dace. Let us know what you think about what we think. Steve at SteveDace.com is the email address. That's D-E-A-C-E. You can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, at Steve Dace Show. And then there's always me, we, and Gab. You can go there looking for Steve Dace. And then Parlor as well. Follow us there. If you want clips of the show to watch for free, share with others. YouTube.com slash Steve Dace or Rumble.com slash Steve Dace Show. And if you're a podcast listener, we appreciate you. Please show your appreciation for us. Leave us a five-star review if you haven't done this already, wherever you podcast from. Also, smash that subscribe button for us. The more of you that keep doing that, the more it pleases both the algorithms, the Skynet that is in charge of our lives these days, as well as uh, the powers that be at the blaze. They like to see that action as well. Thank you to the thousands of you that have done both of those things for the program already. Which brings us now to our final hour of the week. So it's time for some Feedback Friday. You guys ready to go? Go. Let's begin. Um, where? Let's start with Donna in Syracuse. Please call the friend you spoke of on Friday's show and let him know my husband and I will never vote for Trump again. We will be praying from this day forward that he won't run. Huge missed opportunity was that speech. It was nothing more, meaning the CPAC speech. It was nothing more than a repeat of his rallies. There was no self-reflection. It was all me, me, me. I was robbed. 
I'm starting to think he really is as awful as some say. I used to really like his bluntness, but it's apparent to me now that he uses the American people to fuel his ego. I would never trust him. Not one word of the future, no new vision. Um, and in fairness, we kept we got so disgusted, we turned it off and switched to the Iowa-Ohio State basketball game. Uh, and that was actually a much better show. The only thing I heard and really liked is that he's going to be primarying my congressman, John Katko, who just voted for the Equality Act. Um, it comes as no surprise to me that Fox people were saying how great this speech was. Now, here's why I'm including this. I actually got several emails like this, and I was surprised. Now, part of me wonders, okay, um, has our show, show grown to the point that we are getting some of what Rush used to call seminar callers? Remember that? Hmm, I People, do. Yeah, that were lefties that were, you know, on a script to call in and make it look like, you know, uh, this is really how the conservative base thinks, okay? I, I kind of wonder, have we grown enough now that some of the um, lefty platforms out there view us as worthy of of spamming, okay? Also, I, I'm sure the, the element of never Trump that was actually conservative, not Bill Kristol or David French, but like real right winger that just didn't think Trump was trustworthy in 2016 and worthy of the presidency. I'm going to attract an unusually high amount of those people because I was one of them at the time. And then I worked for the candidate that a lot of them preferred instead in Ted Cruz. So I, I wanted to find out if, if you guys had heard, because I've not seen this reaction anywhere outside of my inbox, but I did get uh, a good handful of responses like this in my inbox to Trump's CPAC speech. What do you think? I haven't heard anything like this. Okay. I think the most honest exclamation explanation for that first of all i don't just in and of itself without even analyzing what the motivation is behind it fine but really not i'm not just like this was steve's resetting after trump run i'm not remotely threatened about your decision to do whatever you want to with donald trump down the road it, it fine i i think though it's in a lot of people it's just a lot easier this might be the most honest answer of uh, all for you personally. It's just a lot easier to say that now that he's not, he lost or he's not there anymore and you can just kind of let it all out. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you, it's everything's at stake, he's got to win, otherwise Biden's got, and you, do, the, the, you just can't go there. You, so you're hanging on to whatever way you define hope and I'll deal with Trump again another time. And now you're just like, it's really nice I didn't do it with Trump, and I'm just, he disgusts me, and I really want to move on. I think there's a lot of just emotional and psychological baggage with carrying Donald Trump. I totally get it. And some people like this are just being honest. Like, they're trying to speak into existence. Please, never again. Something else, anything else, the t-shirts we have, uh, um, any reasonable adult, you know, 2020, mm -hmm. they just want, it's they're having a grown-up reaction. I want, I got to have something better. I got to have something different. I get it. It's funny is one of the, one of the uh, reactions uh, that, uh, that was written about there is the, basically the big takeaway that I had from that speech. I was listening to it, editing, getting it ready uh, on Monday morning. And um, I just started laughing. That dude just never changes. He just does not change change for better or worse i mean Some side people by find side that reassuring si side by side with joe biden i mean the dude is virile and and just uh energetic he's alive but um he's alive. you know <laughs> wow i didn't even mean that for that to be funny that's just uh just, just uh, that's Freudian why it was funny there. yeah yeah that's why it was funny <laughs> um but it's the same thing over and over and over again She's absolutely right. He just does not change. And along the lines of what Todd said, I simultaneously reject two things. I, I totally realizing that one of them will never happen, but I, I reject the notion that nobody else should run for president 
against Trump should he decide to run. And I reject uh, I reject the, the notion that there is um, that there's no chance um, that there's no chance that somebody else could be the nominee. Again, this is 2024 that we're talking about long ways down the road. I would like to see a primary, though, because in my mind, you say it's not really worth running against Trump. Well, that's why we have a primary process um, as well. So that's uh, that's that's the main thing, though. He's not going to change. He hasn't changed yet. Um, Did I ever tell you the definition of insanity? To me, um, what she described is nothing new. It's why I had this, I didn't, all all I saw of Trump's speech is what we talked about on the show, the clips you chose. I mean, I've, I've said this on the show for the last several years, unless he is speaking into a teleprompter, Like he gives, he's given phenomenal, he gave phenomenal speeches at State of the Unions, for example, Uh, the speech uh, at uh, Mount Rushmore last 4th of July, unless he is speaking into a teleprompter with words written for him, I I, I just, I'm not into the persona at all. I I just, I'm not really into president slash um, Tonight Show host act. I'm just not. Some of y'all like that and that's okay. I mean, that's, that's fine. Yeah, I like something a lot more serious than that, uh, so that when you then bring the hammer of humor down to humiliate your opponents, it, it it has an oomph of gravitas and potency, and not just well, we're just trolling because for trolling's sake. But I also know that I'm in the minority on my own movement and industry with that opinion. I which I don't really care about that either. To each his own, but. I also knew that if if I if I subjected myself to that on a regular basis, I would grow so nauseated by it that I would not be able to, in any way, shape, or form, objectively analyze his accomplishments as president. And as much as I would prefer a more serious figure for president, the reality is he got me some really serious results on stuff I actually care about that people who appeared to be far more serious figures either didn't attempt or couldn't get done. And in the end... I don't I don't need a I don't need a daddy. I don't need a buddy. I don't need a friend. Um it, you know it's like the great prophet Nick Nolte once said to Eddie Murphy in the movie 48 Hours, we ain't partners, we ain't brothers, we ain't friends. Just do your damn job, okay? And I thought he did his damn job pretty well overall, provided I removed the personality component. Now, I'm unique in my ability to do that. I've also discovered the last few years. As we talked about to open the show yesterday, there's a lot of my neighbors in suburban America that could not do that. And they are already paying a very, very bitter price for that as we speak. They're watching a massive jump in gas prices, for example. They just found out they're not getting COVID relief checks. They now have to fight off boys taking their daughter's place uh, at school events. All right. And they could not decide that mean tweets were so bad that um, I had to overlook that overall prior to March 15th of last year, things in America were very good. We had the highest percentage of Americans in the workforce ever. We had the lowest unemployment in minority communities ever. We had the largest uh, growth in median family income by some estimations going back to 1969 by every estimation since the dot-com boom. Those things are pretty good. We had a sane immigration policy. We were, we were signing peace deals all over the Middle East and giving up nothing in return, really. No, no additional Israeli land for peace, none of that. I mean, that seems like that was pretty good, right? Yeah. So, you know, I I chose, in my view, to be an adult and overlook the things about him that annoyed me and prioritize the things that mattered the most. And on the things that mattered the most, he often delivered. But I understand that a lot of people can't compartmentalize that way. And, and And I also understand the desire for an admirable figure as the leader of your country. I have that desire as well, but... If, if the choice is someone who gives me a warm fuzzy or someone who does the damn job, I, you know, maybe I wouldn't have had this answer at 37. I don't know. But at 47, yeah. I just want somebody to do the damn job. Thank I think you. we should clear one thing up because I, I don't think this person in any way. No, insinu- I'm, I'm only talking about my own no, 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 I know, experience but, in this area. But I okay. think and I think you'll agree with me. There is we may disagree if you decide to vote for Trump or not vote, but there is a difference 
in my mind, and I think Steve's going to agree, in just simply I'm I'm not voting for Trump versus I'm not voting for Trump, but I'm voting for Biden. Oh, totally That's agree. That's a totally different yeah, thing. It's one thing to take a, a stand. Dude, you cannot reject, hey, I'm not going to vote for either one of these guys because I reject false binary choices. Okay, cool. We do too. But then, um, well, that's why I'm voting for, then you don't yeah. reject false binary exactly. choices. Yes. Uh, Renee Kemmer writes, the more I hear Ron DeSantis and Christy Nome, why would any conservative want Trump to be the Republican nominee at almost 80 years old when we have these kinds of great young leaders? Um, and, and yes, Biden is way too old. Please address this on your show. I, I have. I, I agree with this. I, I don't. No one has presented me a good answer to this shit. Not my people have tried in my inbox. I don't, you know, I don't know why we would want somebody who will be 79 at the next Republican convention who has exceedingly high negatives. And I mean, the reality is the guy lost, he lost 40 seats on his house watch long before we had mail in voting that we had this last year. And a lot of that was almost all exclusive to loss of support in the suburbs. So we already we already saw that flaw, right? We we he's already such a well defined figure, and DeSantis gives me a next level of a, of, of achievement. In that the the extra layer of stuff we'd love Trump to do too, that he talks and tweets about a lot, we're seeing DeSantis do that stuff like in real time. And as much as I love Christy Noman, I do. I, it. It's a lot easier governing South Dakota than it is Florida, if we're just going to be honest here. Mm -hmm. Like I've said before, if you got, if you all spot a Democrat and on the rest side of the road in South Dakota, anywhere outside of the South Dakota or South Dakota state campuses, y'all call 911. Hey, what is this? I mean, y'all don't know what you spot a Democrat, you know, just walking down the side of a road or driving down the street. And a co you see a coexist bumper sticker in South Dakota, you call 911. In Florida, dude, if you win a statewide election by three to five points, you're King freaking Kong. Okay. So, you know, DeSantis is doing this in the most politically polarized large state in America, which means that tells me from a professional politician standpoint, meaning not just do I have the right beliefs, but can I perform the task at hand? Can I do the job? A lot of you have better beliefs than me. Can you do this job? Can you hold a conversation with yourself or a couple of buddies in the rest of the country for a couple of hours? Could you do that? That's the job. The job here is not have the right beliefs. In case you had noticed, even here amongst us at the Blaze, we have varying beliefs on things, right? Yes. That's, so the job's not have the right beliefs. The job is, can you hold my, the attention of an audience? That's the job. Same thing with politicians. The job's not vote the right way on policy. The job is, can you do the job of politics? Because if you can vote the right way on policy, but can't craft a narrative, can't defend your own narrative, can't defend your vote, don't know what questions to ask at hearings, how to ask them, how to hire the right staff, that's the job. Can you do that job? His team has shown in the most high pressure environment an executive office holder in America could have outside of Washington, D.C. itself, his team has shown, he and his team have shown, they can do the job. We were talking off the air yesterday. What, 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 what impresses me about DeSantis and his political team is how often they preemptively end up doing this stuff that I would be like, that's what I would do if somebody called me up and said to do that. And then I read there, they did it before I even thought of like, when, how many times have we had to sit here with virtually every Republican, our entire careers and literally grab their hand and hold them, hold it for them and walk them across the street in this process. Always. Always. We've never done that with this guy. This guy ends up actually doing, this guy and his team, because it ain't just him, and that's good that it's not just him, by the way, because you can't just be you when you go to Washington, D.C. either. You're going to have to hire an entire federal government, right? Yes. So he and his team end up, are already doing the stuff that if we had to sit down on our show and think of, okay, how would we do this? How would we counter this? They are already doing all that in real time already. And he's far more likable. I, I, don't, I just don't know why... Let's run the guy that a bunch of our voters have already decided they don't want to ever vote for again. I can understand doing it again if like everybody else was, you know, Mitt Romney and a consultant whore, right? Yeah. I totally would get it. But is that what everybody everybody else is going to be? No. No. So if I could get all the same issues 
without any of the baggage, or at least a lot less baggage or different baggage that hasn't been quantified and defined by my opponents to my, uh, to my detriment yet, strategically speaking, why would I not do that? I can't think of a good reason why. Which is why I haven't seen any good reasons. Anybody give me any good answers to my question yet? But I think the fact, as much as you love politics, and even I understand with my desire not to talk about the next presidential race at all, uh, certainly in the first year after the last one, I think everybody knows how potentially crazy that decision could be, which is why we're spending as much time mm -hmm. as we are talking about yep. it now. Yep. It's like, it's the opposite of another brick in the wall. It's like trying to take this thing down one brick at a time just so it goes away. Yeah. Then there's this from Chris in Colorado who says, you know, the right and all and the talking head world talking about strategy for 2022 and elections beyond. We I see it. Nothing matters, whether it's Trump, Noam, DeSantis, pick a name. Nothing matters if election integrity is not fixed. Correct. Yes, it is. With your background in politics, ever think that your platform is impactful enough to drive election integrity by itself? No, we're not big enough. Um, is our platform here, though, at, at the blaze? Big enough? Oh, yeah. Um, and, and this is, you know, what you're, what you're lamenting, Chris, is one of our friends, uh, Daniel Horowitz, is, uh, this is his lament all the time. All of our focus all the time is a movement in an industry on the next soap opera, the next election, and it, we just kind of, you know, trip over from a political standpoint – we trip over dollars to pick up dimes and we, we just skip over the fundamentals of existence itself and just go right to the outcome of the next election. But you are correct. That's, I believe, the number one and two and three reasons they lost those two Senate seats in Georgia is they, the, their voters just enough of their voters didn't think they were serious about addressing this and stayed home. The other reason is a whole bunch of people that were maybe iffy on how to vote got offered two thousand dollars by one party and six hundred dollars by another. Well, who's going to pick two? Who's going to choose six hundred bucks when you if, if if you're driven by that, right? Okay, mm -hmm. who's going to say yeah, yeah, I'll just take the six hundred when two thousand's on the table, right? Now right. a lot of those voters are about to find out they're getting nothing, and they ain't going to like it. You voted for it, so choke on it. But you're right about that, Chris. Eric writes, the new name for the Redskins should be the Washington Anal Swabs. Aaron, your thoughts? This seems like an Aaron issue to respond the to. The Washington Anal Swabs. I think that Washington Anal Swabs uh, was... Was. was was it even hey, yeah, <laughs> yeah that's even the abbreviation for the team right yeah everybody at the games can just you know the um vuvuzelas whatever country that was that you use those really south annoying south africa south africa those really annoying plastic horns for the world cup um everybody in the stadium at fedex field can just go was all the time i think that's perfect and if you are a redskins fan with daniel snyder as your open Oh, owner, you're used to taking it uh, up the backside <laughs> anyway, right? So it just all fits seamlessly, so to speak. Um, Jeff in Charlotte says, do you think there will be a backlash at all with younger people coming out of high school? Having been affected so much by these school lockdowns, the blatant exposure of left-wing brainwashing going on in these schools, etc., it is natural for people to rebel, and these kids have been affected by far more than the rest of society. I pray there's a major backlash against government overreach, but it may be too late. Here's the thing, Jeff. The answer to your question is yes, but nature abhors a vacuum. The dog returns to its own vomit. There's a, there's a reason why in the New Testament, Paul writes, after you're saved. And this was, this was one of those things that was like a eureka moment for me early in my faith walk. Because you get converted and, you know, one of Billy Graham's all-time famous messages, books, just as I am. Just as you are right now, all the baggage you have, all the sin you have on you, you can go to the cross just as you are right now and be redeemed and reborn in the name of Jesus Christ. But here's the thing, though. While that happens and you're given a new lease on life, 
all of that baggage and temptation does not instantly go away. That's part of the sanctification and discipleship process. Some of it goes away right away. Some of it goes away over time. Some of it sticks around and around and around. And you just trust that he who has begun a good work in you is faithful until the day of its completion. And one of the things that I think we struggle with after conversion is we, we get into this cycle that I call give up and try harder. We white knuckle it. Meaning that we are we, it, that our focus is on not returning to who we were. But yet, while we're focused on not returning to who we were, what are we still focused on? Who we were. Like, how many, like, let's say you've got a porn habit. And I, I, the reason I use that one a lot is because it's one of my own personal struggles. And so that, it's one I just know well. You know, I, it'd be hard for me to talk about meth or other things, other vices. I don't know those things really well. But this one I do know well. Okay. So... It's auto, it's semi-autobiographical. I, I spent a, a week in Haiti eight years ago on a mission trip, seeing some of the worst suffering in on this entire planet. Poorest country in our hemisphere. And you know what I never thought about the whole time I was there? Serving other people, witnessing to other people, being witnessed to uh, I mean, seeing the the impact of a civil what happens to a civilization that forsakes the laws of nature and nature's God, right? On an ex on an existential level. Weird, you know what I never thought of the whole time I was there. Porn. It's kind of strange, like like I'm living out the kingdom of God. I'm serving uh, my mind. It's not about me. It, it, you know what I'm saying? It's like I wasn't. It, it wasn't like I just we had the internet. OK, um, we stayed at the only five star hotel in Port-au-Prince because we had Stephen Baldwin with us, a movie star. All right. Now, the rest of the time that when we weren't sleeping there, though, man, we were in the worst of the worst areas. But, dude, I could have come back to my hotel room, you know, if I had to get a fix in a little release. I could have got my porn on. It just it wasn't even on my 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 radar screen, man. You know why? Because I was I had stepped into another kingdom. I was living literally a different life. And my focus was not at all on me. What does this have to do with your question? Everything. Because those kids can be really upset about what has happened to them, what, what, what was robbed of them. But if there is no alternative worldview for them to step into, you know, we sit around here, I'm not going to sin, I'm not going to do this anymore, I'm not going to do this anymore, it would, ultimately you're going to end up doing it. It's what your mind is on. That's why Paul says, put your mind on things above. Don't sit there and contemplate all the bad stuff you don't want to do. In fact, in Romans 7, Paul describes why that's a terrible idea. It always ends poorly. The, the evil I don't want to do, I do. The good I do want to do, I don't. I'm a wretch. I'm terrible. But when you set your mind on things above, now I have a new way of life. And yeah, it literally is. That's why the double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. The flesh inside of you does not want to let go of the old way. You'll be fighting all that until the day God calls you home. That fight does not end. Similarly, if that generation that's been screwed over here, if we have nothing to offer them other than vote for Mitch McConnell, root and branch to save America again. We have nothing else to offer them. Eventually, the dog will return to its own vomit. They're mad now. They're frustrated now, right? I mean, you were mad how many times? I sinned. I did it again. Mad at myself. I'm not doing it again. Yeah, you find yourself doing it again. There's nothing else. That you, dog returns to its own vomit. What new kingdom? What new worldview would they step into? How many churches in America are still shut down? And so right now, yeah, they're angry, they're upset, they're mad, and they should be. They've been robbed. But eventually, they'll return to that which robbed them if there's nothing else. So this is why I'm always talking about what is the counter narrative we have? 
What is our affirmative way of life compared to the left and the spirit of the age? We're great at pointing out their weaknesses and flaws. How do we want civilization conducted instead? Instead. And then what we often do is we lack, frankly, the balls to confront the spirit of the ages premise of the argument. And so we'll take the worst manifestation of the spirit of the ages argument, like we're doing with, with, with tranny madness right now. You know, we got on one hand, Trump is giving a speech at CPAC. We're never, we're not letting your daughters lose sports to guys while they got a, a you know, a mentally ill gender dysphoric individual hosting a booth at CPAC. That's as, that's just, that's just as conservative movement as it gets. Hey, go ahead. We'll validate your mental illness and and your demonic deception, provided that um, we get a conscience clause from youth sports. But everywhere else, it's totally fine. That loss, you lost. You lost. You already lost the argument. So what is our alternative worldview to you guys have been screwed over and, and the spirit of the age sucks? Cool. What are we doing instead? We almost never answer that question. That's why we get accused of being reactionaries. You know why we're often accused of being reactionaries? Because we're often reactionaries. Did you know free email services like Gmail and Yahoo? Well, they aren't really free. You pay with your privacy. And since those companies have access to every email you send and receive, Big Tech can sell your data to the highest bidder. That's why you often start getting loaded with spam notes. When you use those email servers as well, because they are selling your data to spammers. That's why you want to start using StartMail to secure your email and make you feel safe again. It keeps your email private, period. Every email encrypted, even if the recipient doesn't use encryption, which means big tech can't read, scan, analyze, or sell your personal information ever. Not even Big Brother can snoop around that email. Startmail also prevents government agencies from spying on you as well, like in dragnet operations. With Startmail, by the way, too, delete means deleted. It's gone forever. Startmail, also, this is an important point now, uses its own servers, not like in an Amazon, which means they can't ever be put out of business like what happened temporarily to Parler. All right? Startmail. Backed by the most stringent privacy laws in the world, get unlimited anonymous aliases and more. If you don't trust big tech, start securing your email privacy right now with Startmail. Sign up today. Get 50% off your first year. 50% off your first year when you go to startmail.com slash Steve. That's Startmail with a T. S-T-A-R-T mail.com slash Steve. 50% off for peace of mind and privacy right now for your first year at startmail.com slash Steve. All right, let's get back to some feedback Friday. All right, we've got a couple of folks that want to tackle the gambling question. You guys ready to go? Probably. Let's see how they did. Sure. Right. This is from Brad Collins in Alabama. And he says that gambling is wrong because you're putting all your money in a pool and someone walks away with everything. How is that loving your neighbor as you love yourself? In contrast, if I invest in a business, yes, it is a risk, but it is right because I expect that the business will provide value, a product slash service that a customer voluntarily and happily exchanges money for. Uh, I think, number one, if you put all your money, if 20 years ago, would you have considered Lehman Brothers? A legitimate business? Did that turn out to be a legitimate business? No. No. What about Enron? Would, would, would that have been considered a legitimate business? Yep. Uh, I, 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 I think if, if we're talking about like using some, you know, backwater bookie or something somewhere, this argument may apply. First of all, I reject the notion that anytime I win and someone else loses, that that's not loving my neighbor as I love myself, regardless of format. There's winners and losers right on into eternity. I mean, when Jesus returns, he separates us from sheep. He separates us into two groups, sheep and goats. So that's another nice way of saying winners and losers, right? Are the goats the losers here in that equation? Would they be the losers? Are the goats? Yeah, the goats, the losers, and the sheep and goats judgment. Who's the loser? There's a winner and a loser in that judgment, right? 
Right. The sheep are the winners. Yes. The goats are the losers. So I, I think there's all kinds of things that we do that uh, there's clear winners. Of the, so there's an Olympic race. There's a winner and a loser. If I win it, I wasn't loving my neighbor as I love myself. Um, also, I think when you're talking about wagering on things like the National Football League, the NBA, these are some of the most highly credible from a, uh, a an investment standpoint businesses in the entire world. Tennis, we might have a different conversation. <laughs> or soccer. <laughs> Not true. Yes. Uh, but but um, I, I don't understand your argument. Do you understand the argument he's trying to make? I mean, ultimately... Well, it, I understand it. I just, I don't agree with okay. the conclusion. Well, I don't I either, mean, but I wanted to make sure I'm understanding his argument properly before I disagree with sure. it. For example, if you all... is is every when, you, when, when a stock is invested in, is all the investment on one side? Well, no, right? Some people are investing in a stock to fail. Some people are investing in a stock to succeed. Okay? When all those people put their money in there, there's uh, some people are going to walk away with a loss, right? Yes. Okay. So I, I don't understand the argument here. I don't. So let's, let's put this into perspective here. Let's say... A year ago, um, a year ago, February, a year ago, February, I decide, Steve, I've had enough. I'm starting my own restaurant. I've got the funding there. I've got the staff there. I've developed my menu that includes Swedish fish for the dessert <laughs> and I'm ready to go. I've even got a, a chef in mind. I've hired some staff already. I'm going to start a restaurant. Now, I didn't have enough money to do that by myself, so I took out a loan. Or maybe I did have enough money to start it myself, but I'm putting out a very good percentage of my personal wealth and fortune, risking putting that on the line to start that business. Next month, it goes belly up because there's something completely out of my control that happens. It goes completely belly up. Was I gambling? Yeah. Yeah. We it's just called investing risks. in a different in a different context, but it's it's called that's investing what it is. in a, in a different context. Anytime, anytime you make a decision with your wealth, your talents, your time, the things that they don't make any more of. Anytime you make a decision, you're gambling. You're you're taking a risk. Now there are there are games of skill and there are games of chance. If you're talking about games of chance, when you're talking about playing the lottery, you know that. We can have a conversation sure. about that. Yeah. But when it comes to skill, betting on yourself, that's that's not that's not necessarily I don't really even call that gambling. I'd call that uh, I would call that investing, if you would. Or one's an investment and the other one is too, or they're both yep. gambling. Exactly. But one just because just because we decided eighty years ago that soybeans were a legitimate thing to wager on, and so we get to call it investing now, doesn't doesn't make it any less gambling. The, the soybean futures are a gamble. Just as betting on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers twenty three to or twelve to one to win the Super Bowl, as I did, that was a gamble. That was another kind of future. Now, this is a more interesting take from Keith Anderson. Consider that investing and gambling, while both involving an element of risk, are not equal in their practice. One was rewarded by the master in the parable of the talents. He's talking about the in uh, the. Uh, in the New Testament, one of Jesus' parables. The servants didn't gamble to increase their master's account balance. They invested smartly and were rewarded for that. What's the difference? What, 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 who? In the last few years, I have correctly bet a World Series winner at 23 to 1, a Super Bowl champion at 12 to 1, and before this college basketball season, I bet a team that was not even ranked in most polls, 40 to one to win the national championship. They're ranked number two in the country right now. I got a pretty good track record, don't I? In spotting sports futures. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Would you consider it somewhat wise, a wise investment to follow my knowledge of athletic futures, given that recent track record? Sure. A lot of people who do. Now, do I have any kind of track record on soybean futures? Or what the price of silver will be a year from now. Do I know anything about that? Much less. So that would be very risky, right? Yes. But if, but given the knowledge I've already demonstrated on athletic futures, that would be considered a smart bet, a smart investment. Sure. See what I'm getting at here? What defines what is smart and what is not? 
well, probably the end result, I would imagine. Any basketball coach will tell you the difference to them getting fired and 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 extended is did that ball go in? Really, ultimately, yes, right? And, and you'll come back with and you'll come back with well, you're betting on things that are completely out of your control. Yeah. Well, the example that I just gave, had I started a restaurant or any hospitality service of February of last year, if I had started it then, was the what was the response to the coronavirus within my control? Heck no, it wasn't. So I mean, unless I'm the things, C- unless I'm the CEO of Monsanto. Yeah. How am I betting? How how do I control soybean futures if I'm way, if I'm if I'm investing in them? Unless I'm the CEO of Monsanto, how would I? I own a farm with 50 acres. What the hell does that have to do? What, I mean, I, can't, I have no control over the future of soybeans. My farm goes belly up; it does nothing to the market. My farm does great; does nothing to the market. So he goes on to make this point: um, investing relies on the mutual success of the business being invested in and the person doing the investing. Gambling relies on, see, I disagree with that. Gambling relies on one person's loss in order for another person to gain. No, it doesn't. Well, yes, it does. But both scenarios actually do in what you're articulating. Both scenarios do. I need Tom Brady to be really good for my Tampa Bay Buccaneer bet to pay off, right? Yeah. So there's mutual success there. Didn't we just go through the whole GameStop stock thing? Yes. Do you know what precipitated that? Yes. It was a bunch of really, really fat cats, uh, hedge fund managers, uh, betting against the success yes. of GameStop. And then basically a bunch of GameStop fans on, on, them. <laughs> on, on Reddit decided, we love GameStop, so we're going to, if this is all yep. that matters, if it's all a shell game, of, uh, and the stock's, and a company's value is based on the perception of their stock, and not really a, a, a hardcore PL statement, but enough people can leverage the money that it's just all just done on pure speculation then hey we're a bunch of nerds in our mom's basement watching you know reddit bucks, forums 30 bucks and yeah. we live we, we had 30 bucks 50 bucks we go to gamestop all the time we want the company to stick around so let's make that stock it expl- that stock then explode so the idea of of mutual six so aaron opens his restaurant same exact kind of restaurant that also has swedish fish on the menu for dessert opens across the street what are the odds they're both going to be successful very, very low. Very low. Chances are one, either both will fail. Neither or, can live while the other survives. Or, or one, either both fail or one will be successful and the other is not. Gambling relies on one person's loss in order for another person to gain. That's not necessarily true. First of all, you don't have to place a wager. You don't have to do any of this. You go in and make, you go in and assume the risk. In this learned speculation. Now, listen, if we're talking about old people sitting there one quarter of a time tossing their Social Security checks away at a casino in a in a a, to a a, basically a jukebox, otherwise known as a slot machine. That's an entirely different conversation. I'm talking about learned speculation. You guys can't have yet to make an argument to me that learned speculation in some forums is superior to doing it on a sporting event. Particularly because at this point right now, what do you trust more? The outcome of an NFL game or um, what, 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 what the share price is in a stock market heavily leveraged by hedge funds? What would you trust more in? An NFL game. Yeah, what do you trust more? The National Football League or Lehman Brothers? Todd, go. Uh, well, that's an argument. I could uh, trust the NFL more. Yeah. Or as much. Yeah. Des- desiring someone else's loss in order for me to gain... Now, I thought, found this interesting, too, would violate Luke 631, and just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. Really? You don't want China to lose? You don't want Russia to lose? You don't root for the USA during the Olympics? Who's your favorite, who's your favorite team, Keith? You don't want, you, when, when they're playing their rival, you don't want the rival to lose? When, when I was, when I lose a bet... I was not wronged. I was wrong. Yes. I was not wronged. Yes. You assume the risk, made the decision, and you lost. Right. But he is right about this. Keith is right about this. P.S. Superman is the greatest superhero of all time, and I also love the John Williams score. So it's all good. We've totally kissed and made up just based on the P.S. I'm with you. That's an interesting close. Because at the end of the day, that's we're talking about, and that's another vice. Listen, I think we often are having the wrong conversation when we talk about yeah. this. I really do. Listen, it's there's no doubt that gambling 
including the stock market, it's all parasitical. It's, it's not a good in and of itself. It relies on other goods to exist. Mm -hmm. Vegas and places, you know, if they're in the... Uh, there's, you know, the gambling that goes on in, in the Middle East. Which country am I thinking, thinking of? Like, they've got, is it Abu, uh, uh, Abu Dhabi? Is that what you're thinking yeah. of? Yeah. You know, they, they rely, they're not, Vegas is not in the middle of the Arab, you know, you have to have enough goods produced in terms of a, a robust economy, all boats rise with the tide, where you can afford to have these vices. Now, these vices, by definition, are not all bad. They're not goods in of themselves, but that doesn't mean they are bad. So here's the thing. If you rob somebody at gunpoint and then turn around and give half that money to the church, yeah. is that wrong? Yes, yeah. that's wrong. You should not do evil because so good can come. Now, just this is the honest question. Just ask yourself a thought exercise. It doesn't mean it's all over. But if you go out to the casino and gamble part of the paycheck that you made in a honest living, a good job, and then gave that to the church. Is that wrong? I think, of course not. Does, does that mean there's not all kinds of problems with gambling? Does that mean it's a good in and of itself? But it would be wrong to give that money to the church if gambling was inherently wrong. And I just, I, but I think that's the honest a for more honest conversation. I think we'd got this Rube Goldberg yeah. four dimensional chess yeah. thing about all trying to outsmart each other on that thing. I'm just, I, I'm kind of, I, I don't get off on, I, I don't enjoy gambling like these two guys do, but I know where their hearts are. I know where their priorities are. I know these are, they, they are vices that they find entertainment and value from. But because their lives are not built on sand, these vices can't take them down. There's all kinds of vices that aren't either good or bad in and of themselves that can destroy us or we can find edification in depending on how the rest of our lives are going. America would be a terrible place if every big city was Las Vegas. But the, it's not. Well said. That's why Peggy wrote, I, when Todd establishes his own state, I want to apply for citizenship. So there you go. Working on it. And I also won a 19 parlay last night. <laughs> uh, this this portion of the show brought to you by realestateagentsitrust.com. If you're getting into the real estate market during these unprecedented times. Bing. Yes. Where, hey, if you don't have the right agent, you could end up being a loser. You can make the wrong investment. I guess you're taking a gamble, Right. So in that case, make sure you go in with an agent that you can trust. This is a company started by Glenn Beck and some of his associates who got tired of real estate agents who talked a good game but didn't deliver the desired results when uh, needed the most. They didn't want that to happen to all of the rest of us. So they started this company so that we could find an agent that we could trust almost anywhere in America. Someone whose track record of success has been fully vetted and verified. If you want to find an agent that you can trust, the name just kind of says it all. Go to real estate agents, I trust.com. Again, that's real estate agents, I trust.com. No, seriously, I did hit a, a 19 parlay last oh, night. Oh, I didn't think yeah. that was a joke. Or, yeah, no, yeah. I, I really did. Yeah. It's hard to do. It is. Even when you pick favorites, it's hard to do. All right. That's going to do it for today's show. We're going to stick around to the overtime for our Blaze TV audience. Uh, the subscribers, that is. That's our best and worst of the week at blazetv.com slash days. That's where you can go to watch this later and subscribe to Blaze TV if you would like. For the rest of you, have a great weekend. Enjoy the warmth. And we'll see you Monday. John 317.